Pete. Good evening. Hey, mate. How are things? Pretty good. Pretty good. I'm enjoying this very smoky scotch you've got here. It's nice and peaty, isn't it? Yeah. What actually is peat anyway? I think it's just um, fortified grass and dirt. So, how do they actually infuse whiskey with peat? Do they <laughs> filter the water through it? <laughs> that makes sense. Maybe. It's very smoky as well. It's a smoky smell from the peat itself. I believe or the it's, distillation. I of believe whiskey. it's from the distilling process. I've always wondered actually what's the difference between scotch and whiskey? I think scotch is a type of whiskey. From Scotland. Originally. And like it- Scotch fabric means that crisscross pattern on kilts, right? I think so. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. But you could have I think technically Oh, actually, I don't know. I'd be speaking from a, an ill-informed position. But I think that American whiskies are generally rye whiskies or bourbon whiskies. And then you've got different varieties amongst that. And Scottish and Irish whiskies are generally Scotch whiskies. But then you've got different whiskies within that as well. So rye whiskies are made from rye as in like a grain plant. Yes. Yes. Right. And then you've got like bourbons that are made from a sour mash which is some sort of mash of some sort of grainy sort of farm-based So, is a whiskey sour one such whiskey or is it actually a regular rye whiskey with a sour ingredient like lemon juice or something like that? Oh, yeah. So, a whiskey sour is a cocktail. So, that's that's just a concoction of generally you would have it as either a scotch whiskey sour or a bourbon whiskey sour and you would add to that lemon juice, egg whites- Probably sugar syrup or something. See, I wonder how much the alcohol industry has thrived. Not the alcohol industry, but the cocktail industry, as in spirits, since Mad Men was on TV. Because that really popularised the idea of, let's have spirits by the daytime. Little trolley on the side, in the workplace, if you will. It's funny, I could not drink scotch barely at all 12 months ago. And once you've had a few and you've got- Once you sort of break into it, it's- Yeah, you just almost never look back. It's kind of like- I mean, you and I, you and I, you and, I, you, and I, you and I met up this time last week and I had a, a rye whiskey neat six o'clock at night. That was very uh, nice. Admittedly, I had a bit of a beer chaser with it, but still- that was because um, I was feeling a little bit poorly and I, that was my excuse to have another drink. But yeah, I think it's um, once you sort of get into it, you can quite happily indulge at all, all hours of the day. And I've been known to have a Jamison's or something before the sun's gone down for sure. I love a whiskey or eh, mainly whiskey on ice and I'll enjoy it because it gives that slight kick. Mm. There's a sharpness to it, obviously, by mm. nature. So it's short sharp little sips opposed to chugging a beer or a long sip of a glass of red wine. Mm -hmm. And then I like that bit where you finish it if you've had it on ice and then you just, when the ice melts, say, 15 minutes later, Mm. just drain the glass with that mainly water with that slight whiskey hue. That's a full ice. What I love, by the way, just to quote you earlier, you mentioned the phrase before, that's my ill-informed opinion. I really do think we should rename this podcast (laughs) our ill-informed opinion as an alternative to what happens next because the whole point of this podcast was going to be that we would actually crystal ball gaze into the future on an issue of some sort, be it politics, sport, movies, where we'd theorise, forecast what would happen next in our humble opinion, with some major event. Rather than just simply reviewing the present, we've kind of like jumped to the next stage. But also- Now it's become a ranting, ill-informed opinion (laughs) on whatever shit has entered our brains (laughs) at some point the last 10 minutes before I hit record. But I think we should give ourselves a bit of credit. We weren't necessarily trying to take the two to one on favorite of what would happen next. Often it was, what would you do if you were in that position? Yeah, yeah. And also what should happen next as opposed to what will happen next. But it was more, yeah, it was a fun sort of opportunity to- And look, it still can be. Let's not say it's dead and buried. I think we've still got to strive for that, definitely. But I think we could have it um, a Stanley Kubrick novel, straight Stanley Kubrick movie. <laughs> it could be called- what happens next or in brackets <laughs> or my ill-informed opinion. Two men, three drinks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or how I le- what is it? How I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. That, that's what it could be. What happens next, brackets, or I start drinking and talking shit with my friend. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Close brackets. Or I'm six drinks in and you, all you get is my ill-informed opinion. Well, 
The idea of this podcast was meant to be about recording a chat with a mate for posterity, just to have some sort of record of catching up and sharing our thoughts and sharing them with the world. And what happens next was a pretty cool concept, which in Silicon Valley terms, we may pivot away from ultimately or come back to. But you're right. It wasn't about necessarily crystal ball gazing like we're having a punt. It was if we were in the shoes, if we were the armchair expert of for the day in the shoes of, let's say, Donald Trump or Rudy Giuliani or someone, this is what we'd say. Oh, hang on. Can you just adjust that light behind you there? Oh, that's really um, it's really making a beautiful um, mood for us here tonight in the, um, in the spare bedroom. It's, it's a- it's, I mean, I'll describe it for our listeners. It's a floor lamp. It's a, actually a desk lamp that has been moved to the floor and it is permeating this beautiful soft glow of um, white light on a cream painted wall sort of beneath where we are sitting. So, the underside of our chins are sort of illuminated against the cream wall, if you could imagine that. And the shadows on our deeply creviced <laughs> faces are being... <laughs> exaggerated as a result. But so, this is a very exaggerated and verbose way of saying it's a white room with desk lamp on the wall, on the floor, casting but, a bit of light against the wall. But that leads us to the importance of lighting and, and how it can be used in domestic situations. Well, it's funny. I know you're kind of joking, but I'm a huge advocate of the idea, if there isn't already a general title for this profession, of a lighting designer. No, there is. There is? Yeah. No, I've They're seen, not I've as ubiquitous as, say, landscape designers or obviously no. house architects or interior designers, but I don't understand how you can have these sensational buildings built or homes and people stick 20 fucking halogen light globes in the ceiling above their kitchen and you feel like you're there with clarity to the vein if you want to try and inject Everyone, you can see every pore, every follicle on someone's head. Was it your- It's crazy. Your previous house, didn't someone try and tell you to put way more than you actually put in or something? Yeah, exactly. When we renovated, the standard halogen lights for a living space was per- like one light every meter, basically. And we chose 30% of the standard number. And I found that even too bright. And I've got a theory that, do you recall there was a history where we went from light globes that stuck out of the ceiling, then we went to those down lights that were basically the same size light globes, but kind of recessed in the ceiling. Yeah. They're quite almost a plate size, but like yeah. a saucer plate sized mm. hole in the ceiling. And then someone discovered halogens about 20 years ago, and we haven't looked back. And I personally hate halogen lights because if you have a small light- It just has to produce a concentrated amount of light from a smaller space. It's like a fire hose. It's like a fire hose. And the best lighted lighted places I've been to, the best lit places I've been to, are actually often pubs where they have old school wall-mounted lights that cast a beautiful light up the wall, Mm. then reflect it off the whiter painted ceiling. Mm. And therefore, everyone looks pleasant because they're not being illuminated by this ridiculous, harsh spotlight from above. They're not being interrogated. Yeah. It's by the like, DA. I could pretty much move to any house, turn off every ceiling light and just use Lamp, desk lights, lamps, lamps yeah, and totally. be happy. And be really happy. And we're currently to renovate my studio office space now for our podcasting. And that's gonna be mainly we thought about wall lamps, but then it's expensive to try and mount a you know a light in the wall from scratch. Well, we're, we're tax deducting we're, all this, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, from our mega millions rolling in. A tax deduction on zero is zero. <laughs> so we're looking at just buying IKEA standing lamps that will project light against the wall and off the ceiling and give a softer hue. It drives me insane that people can design spectacular glass, yeah. concrete, stainless steel structures. They get the lighting so wrong. And the lighting's an afterthought. Or same people who buy these like really expensive pieces of art and don't light them properly. Or And it sort of leads also into PowerPoint placement. This house is fairly old. It's been fairly interestingly renovated. And the placement of the PowerPoints, I'm looking at that one that's halfway up the wall at about 
nipple height right next to a window, the only window. And in when the you room. say nipple height, you mean the nipples of a Shetland pony? Oh, it's, I mean, it's sort of, <laughs> it's between, it's above waist height for most people. And um, from the window, it's like, what were they ever going to plug in there? Maybe it was for a double bed in those days where you'd mount a clip on lamp for reading above the headboard. Maybe. Maybe. But yeah, I mean, just that kind of thing. You just go. Anyway. Well, here's a funny well, thing. What happens next? What happens next, Penny? Oh, well, this is what happens next. So, Mr. Bugger Lugs Electrician <laughs> comes in to add PowerPoints to my rejig study. This is to hold a serious amount of tech. And he suggests having two doubles, so four PowerPoints. And I said, mate, I've got about six hard drives, computer, TV, multiple speakers, lamps. Like, I would have 20 devices plugged in. And I eventually coaxed him as he was weirdly reluctant (laughs) to put in, I think in the end, it was four doubles, so eight PowerPoints. And then what I'll do is have uh, surge protectant power boards boards off those. But it was just bizarre that he was so reluctant. He said, oh, mate, that cost you an extra hundred bucks to install. And I said, otherwise, I'm going to have 10 power boards off 10 power boards. But what am I paying you for? It's crazy, crazy. And then I was trying to push to have the internet hardwired. And he was insistent on getting like a Wi-Fi to somehow stretch, you know, 100 meters. And I said, mate, I'm downloading, uploading. You so know, much porn. So much porn. So many porn-centric I've actually, podcasts. I've actually got- one of those little cheat systems whereby I don't have to keep pressing enter the whole time. It just keeps downloading constantly. It's like those little plastic chips that you put into the poker machine. So, it just keeps on pressing the button for you. I love that you're joking about it, but the reality <laughs> would be that if you're actually doing that, you'd be streaming it, not downloading it. Well, I don't understand how it works. That's right. That's the whole point. <laughs> your gag is kind of like lost on your lack of tech skills. That's just my uninformed opinion. Just our uninformed opinion <laughs> with Ben and Philip. <laughs> anyway, so we're going to press ahead and go for a lot of uh, lighting strips. We're going for those old school ceiling lights that are like long rectangular panels yeah. of LED lights with a frosted glass cover. So it has like a general glow from above. Oh, that's what you're having in the studio. Yeah, so not fluorescent lights, but that same idea of having like a long fluorescent light, but it's LED with a frosted top, so it's more diffused. Mm, okay. that's, that's the alternative. And you buy those actually from a regular hardware store and just mount those yourself if you want to. We just, our electrician will do it, but the same idea that you can basically buy these off the rack and just hardwire them in. So we'll do that as in a backup, but mainly floor lamps and desk lamps. How big, for illumination. Um, how big in terms of square meterage is this studio we're talking? Six by four. It's pretty big. So, the, about twice as big as the room we're in now? No, I think this room would be, oh, yeah, this room would be about 3.5 by 3.5 maybe. I was going to say maybe three and a bit by four and a bit. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Three by four. 60% bigger. Double. Yeah. Double. 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 Yeah. I mean, that's just your uninformed. Just our uninformed opinion. Without measuring it. Trademark. We're just spitballing. We're just spitballing here. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good, mate. It's good, mate. So, any other problems for the world to solve? <laughs> it was actually made me think of it when you said you can. I think you just said something like you can mount it that way if uh, you want yeah. to. And I was double I was, entendre the innuendo. I was going to say that's what she said. Yeah, which I think fits in perfectly with that type of phrase in this type of situation. Do you have someone at work say that? Oh, that's actually, what she said. I actually haven't seen that in the workplace, but I'm looking forward to the day when it does happen. I've heard it before in my workplace, but I work in TV, so really? it's a bit more common. But I've only heard it once before, and it was only said amongst men. That expression, that's what she said, I think is kind of circulated from being funny to being frowned upon. And now it's kind of like done a full 360 to being retro cool. Yeah. So now when someone says it, they're saying it and knowing that it's daggy to say it. There's an awareness and the educated, comedic, savvy listener knows it's inappropriate to say. And the comedy is that everyone in the room is smart enough to know it's inappropriate. So it only works in a situation where no one takes offense. I was going to say, no one takes offense. Everyone's a little bit too clever and aware of its inappropriateness. It's kind of like people using, I don't know, sexist or racist terminology when they should know better, but they're saying it to people who also know it's inappropriate. It's trying to be like almost medical. 
you're saying if someone was described to someone who came from China as a China person. Oh, you referred to that US politician. No, I'm just saying like China person would be one way of describing someone which may seem racist to some people, but to people in the know, it's not racist. Well, that's an example of you use that phrase and I saw a recent comedic program where they took the piss out of a ostensibly racist US politician using that expression. West Virginian um, Senate candidate. Yeah. And- who just got out of prison. So, if you said it now, knowing that we've both seen the same sort of comedy satire, which draws attention to the basic implied racism by the politician that used that phrase, you'd be using it. I'd be kind of like nodding knowingly, knowing that well, I know you're not being racist. I know you're an because, Australian person. Australian person. Yeah, but I know that you know that it's inappropriate, mm. but we both saw the same satirical commentary, which- criticize that prejudice language yes big issues i mean what happens next we're crushing we are crushing them all today <laughs> that's right we are just sending them all back decades in their existence that's right what other expressions are there in the workplace halogen though? lighting no one tomorrow is going to buy i mean halogen lighting stocks it's just gonna if you've got shares in halogen lighting and you're listening to this podcast i suggest you consult your stockbroker and see if you can just Drop all your stock in halogen lighting. Sell, sell, sell. <laughs> and buy, buy, buy IKEA, particularly with their new desk lamp and floor lamp range. You are a massive advocate for IKEA, though. You have, you always have been. I'm not saying that as a criticism. I'm saying- Well, that's, that's you just, are. That's just who you are. No, I've always- It's part, I, of, your, it's part of your identity. I was, yeah, through my partner who's half Danish. We've always been into minimalist architecture and stuff. And uh, we've always appreciated a fine- <laughs> Sweden, Denmark, Denmark, they're all the same. <laughs> I've always appreciated a fine oak whitewash wood. Yeah, with, um, a, with a few Allen keys. Slots. No, I've always been a big fan of minimal furniture. I hate those big and, couches. I like thin couches. And flat pack. I've always been a fan of flat pack. Flat pack, yeah. But also it's that space. The reason why I like it is because our spaces have always been so small living in big cities. And we've had to maximise small apartments or small houses that we haven't had the space to have big furniture, which I'm not actually opposed to per se, but it never fit in. So, we have to therefore work backwards. And she, that being her natural taste, it all worked quite well. So, and the good I like thing 60s is- Australian furniture and like oh, okay, Scandinavian yeah. furniture. Uh, yeah. I like uh, you've got leather a nice, you've got and a nice couch. light and woods or a teak. It's very fine in a 60s mm. style. Like, you don't like bulk in your furniture. Yeah, that's just me personally. So, my desk, my dining chairs, dining table, everything's kind of quite lean. Right. Everything's 8% body fat. Yeah, I mean, that's how we live our lives, right? Totally. No spare Even time. Even 80, 80 is probably- Did you say 18? I said 8. Oh, I thought, I thought you said 18. I oh, what's say. 18? I that's- think eight's close to dangerously <laughs> lean. Eight's our playing weight. Let's not muck about. But that's right. And I mean, off-season, I'm maybe- mm. Tripping over 10. I was going to say, maybe, maybe 10 and a half, yeah, 11. Totally. In day, you switch back on, boom, by New Year's, you're back down to eight. Yeah. So, back to your workmates. I can't think what of other next? phrases that I've heard that are inappropriate, you know, besides generally offensive stuff. There aren't any key phrases that jump out. Oh, I just think of that, you know, that, I don't know if you remember the show, The Office, there was that, that sales rep who would come in, I forget his name, like Jonesy or Husey or- Oh, yes. Ja- was it yes. Ja- Jamesy or someone? No, uh, I know what you mean, yeah. And he was um, David Brent's- Mate, he was in the he- same position at the other city. Yeah, but it was like he was his mate, but frenemy. But not, yeah. But they weren't. And Brent thought they were really good mates, but he was just like, oh, just. Oh, he was basically that guy's punching bag. Yeah, yeah. And then, and the last episode uh, of the guy. entire series, he's sort of. When I think of someone saying that's what she said in the office, that's who I think of that guy. Yeah, yeah. And he's sort of like doing like thrusting his groin and making like. You and know, someone bends down to pick up the slow job, pick up something of off the floor, and he goes, Oh, while you're down there, love. Yeah. And they'll yeah. go, Oh, oh, oh that's oh, it. That guy. Oh, I just find yeah. it disgusting. And to me, that feels like a generation ago, but I actually know there are many places that yep. still be quite common. Yeah. I mean, what was it? Um, I don't want to talk about stuff that's in the still in, in before the courts, but was it the um, Macquarie Bank guys who were on that 
trip to Argentina or somewhere and then they were just basically hazing that guy. Anyway. Oh, well, hazing is another story altogether because then it's that's even more complicated. I don't understand these people. I mean, I just think it comes from a cultural background of family or school where people just normalise that sort of behaviour as being totally acceptable and so that's all they know. I mean, that's no excuse for it, but they don't even realise it's sexual harassment or they do and they do it regardless, which then is just arrogant. Yeah. I mean, you and I both have had our fair exposure to human resources professionals in our professional life and <laughs> we all know they come from a place of good they're inherently good people just trying to make um workplaces more cohesive making sure everyone can get along i think they're great people I, i'd say hats off to them i think good hr can be really good and bad hr can be really bad and what i mean is either way the intention can be correct and right but the execution can be the game changer but the heart's always in the right place like any people in any profession, to be fair. The intention's great, but if you can't execute on that intention, then it's meaningless. Can you hear the um, shitty, shitty bang, bang outside? I can't. What's your beloved watching? Oh, she's probably watching Iron Man 7. <laughs> Speaking of which, what's the plan with these franchises, Benny? Are they going to keep on going forever? Or I like that you've asked that question where you don't really want to know the answer. You just want to know where will they end? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, it's I mean, been 10 years. At the time of this podcast, Infinity War is on track to be one of the highest grossing films of all time. One of? It won't outdo Avatar, but it'll probably- Is Avatar still number one? Avatar is number one by a billion dollars. Are you serious? Yeah, it's insane. So A billion dollars? It's, it goes, I think Star Wars The Force Awakens overtook- Titanic at about 1.5, 1.7 billion. Sorry, was that the last Star Wars? That was the first one of the- New batch. Mm, new, batch. new batch. Okay. So, and uh, Christmas 2015 and Avatar. So, I took uh, Titanic, which was by far, at that point, Titanic was about half a billion a- ahead. So, most films were topping out at about a billion. Titanic was about 1.5 billion in total. And Avatar was 2.5 so, Avatar is about- Yeah. And that's all because oh. it was on the higher premium priced 3D tickets. Oh. But also, even with inflation, though, it'd be even more than that, though. That's the thing, is that- well, When was Avatar? 90- I was going to say 10 years ago? 8 years ago? Something like that, yeah. 2000? Uh, 2009? 2010? 2009, I think. Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. So, about nine years ago. Mm-hmm. So, with inflation, it'd actually be more. But anyway, Infinity War is the- end of a 10-year run by the Marvel films. I think those films have made like $17 billion or something in total. Of the if Avenger movies? All the Avenger movies, the cumulative box office international total. So I think uh, the question is this, will superhero fatigue set in and will superheroes, superhero films, which some have been compared to the popularity and the ubiquity of Westerns, like American Western cowboy films, go the same way. Well, we hit a point where basically there's just popular culture exhaustion and people go, you know what? 10, 12, 15 years superhero films, we need a break for a different genre. And I don't think, in my personal opinion, that will happen with Western films for a few reasons. With superhero films? Yeah. Like it did with Westerns? Yeah. What are those reasons? Well, what they're trying to do with superhero films, which I think is really clever to try and avoid this fatigue, is they've moved away from this whole idea of let's have origin movies where we have ordinary person become an extraordinary person through extraordinary means, like being bitten by a radioactive spider or developing a Iron Man suit or whatever it might be, that they're now doing sub-genres within the superhero genre. So that was probably most clearly signaled with Ant-Man being a heist film. Black Panther was a lot about, they called it, I think they called Afro-tech or Afro-futurism. So that's like looking at, I guess, the black experience in a fictional but grounded way. They talked about The Winter Soldier, which was the second... Captain America film was essentially a 70s style espionage film and so on. So basically creating subgenres within the genre. And so it still falls in the overall umbrella of superhero if you like a espionage film. So The Dark Knight, which predated this Marvel renaissance, The okay. Dark Knight was 2008. So that was basically the very same year as Iron Man. And that was essentially, I'd call that Batman meets. Michael Mann's Heat. Yeah. It's got the bank robbery 
high quality. Robert like the Robert De Niro, Al Pacino yeah. kind of dynamic between Heath Ledger and Christian Bale. Grounded, gritty. Yeah. The music by Hans Zimmer, I think, is pretty similar. I can see how if you had the right screenwriters, you could just keep on pumping this stuff out, like you say, with in sort of genre films, but people will go and see it and you'll automatically get half a billion dollars worth of box office because it is a, an Avengers movie. The latest film, Thor Ragnarok, I think it is, which is Thor 3, was basically pitched by the New Zealand director to the studio, which got him the job, as a lethal weapon or cannonball run-esque film, a odd couple action comedy. So the first film was done like a Shakespearean drama, which is how that how Kenneth Branagh managed to secure someone with the gravitas of Anthony Hopkins. Like a Shakespearean drama was Did the whole Kenneth idea. Branagh direct the first Thor? Yeah, and he got that because he basically pitched a Shakespearean take. Then the second film kind of became less like a family tragedy, less Shakespearean and more like a Vikings in space story. And that kind of wasn't as popular. And the third film is basically a comedy. can't imagine why. <laughs> the third film is a comedy. It's a comedy with the Hulk, Bruce Banner and Thor side by side up to space escape shenanigans. Sounds absolutely appalling. <laughs> but I do appreciate the director's work, so I probably will end up seeing it one one day. Oh, it's a very fun film. It's a fun film, but it's still a fun film within a superhero genre. So mm. if you don't like superhero films, you'd find this a better version of that genre, mm. but you won't like it. And that's my dilemma is that some will say, I've got to see so-and-so, it's so great. And I'll see it. Like I'll see something like Infinity War, Avengers Mark Three, And guess for a superhero film, it's- pretty good for most people, but it falls within the spirit of film. So, therefore, I tend to see them these days because I feel like I have to be part of the water cooler conversation. Yeah. But I don't rush there. Like, if Michael Mann puts out a film, even despite his latest films kind of going down in quality, I'd be much more likely to rush to a cinema experience to see his latest work. So, I really enjoyed Deadpool, but- Oh, there you go. That's a raunchy comedy. But there was 15 minutes of that where it was just superheroes doing action stuff with CGI without a lot of dialogue that I was just bored going, oh, this huge giant's picking up a bus and throwing it at someone. This guy's blazing fire under this building. This guy's doing something else. And I was just going, when we're going to get back to the snappy one-line dialogue, you know. Which is basically the R-rated comedy stuff. Yeah. It's the crude comedy it's in that vein of almost American Pie. And I've seen all the Deadpool trailers for the second one. kind of feel like I've seen all the jokes from it, but I don't know. I'm sure, they'll, sure it'll still be good. But again, I'm worried that there's going to be just these huge, long sort of superhero action sequences that are just going to bore me to tears. Well, are you a trailer avoider or do you watch trailers? I don't make a conscious effort to avoid trailers, but if there is a film that I've heard is good and I know it's, you know, in my wheelhouse in terms of director, writer combination, then I will try and just go and see it pretty cold, pretty buzz. And I'll quite happily see a movie that I know nothing about just on the strength of, oh, it's good director, good writer, heard it's meant to be good kind of thing. Yeah. Case in point, probably Hell or High Water or something like that. You know, like that's probably, I think we might have talked about this before, but that is if you say to me, like the ultimate combination of parts that make up a movie, that would be pretty close to a perfect film. Although it's not a perfect film, for my personal tastes, that's got everything that I like in films about it. Like that's all rolled into one and it's pretty, pretty. No Country for Old Men's would be the ultimate, but that Hell or High Water is in that sort of same genre for me and that's probably very close to my perfect film. I really enjoy that film as well. The first film that he wrote that was produced, The Cario. That is my guilty pleasure. And Denny Villeneuve? Villeneuve? Yeah, he's pretty much taken the mantle of Michael Mann for me. So, I'm a huge fan of most of Michael Mann's films, even Miami Vice, which I think is a fantastic film. And Sicario, I just think what thought was amazing. And Prisoners, it's a combination of the soundtrack, the cinematic Scenes that are either slow motion or are very naturalistic and feel very immediate, like you feel very much in the middle of yeah. the crossfire. Particularly that scene at the um, immigration gates. Oh, that is a remarkable with scene. With like the eight lanes of traffic. So, here's the thing. That, that is, you do feel like you are on that freeway. You can just see a film called Den of Thieves that came out recently. Den of Thieves 
pretty much plays homage or if you want to be negative, totally rips off Heat and Sicario right. with many of the same beats, same opening, a very similar scene on the bridge there. It's worth seeing. Maybe we'll review it next time. Okay. But if you enjoyed Heat by Michael Mann or Sicario by Denis, you'll like this. I should watch Sicario again because there's that awesome scene when they're all rolling through the streets on the way to the- Ah, oh, fantastic. To pick up the wit- hitting on the way to pick up the witness and yeah. Hitting all awesome. of the um, bumps in the road and- Yeah, that's awesome. There's this tension as they're talking as they go bump, bump, yeah. bump. Yeah. And the neighbouring at high, lane. At high speed over the speed bumps. And there's yeah. a police car kind of tracking them in a cross street and there are those dead bodies of rats who've spoken and to the authorities. Strung up. It is. All right, mate. I think it's time we, uh, what's the expression you use? Tie the bow on this bad boy. And put this sucker to bed. <laughs> All right, mate. Until next time. Peace out, mate. Double the peace. Peace.